Today I want to go over some of the most salient points in the last podcasts so that you get an understanding of what I'm trying to say. It's like giving you the golden nuggets. There's so much information in each podcast, it's difficult to know what's he trying to say, what's, what's the gist of it. So the main thing I'm trying to say is that the universe is formed of spinning light. At the moment, the physics community believe that the universe is formed of vibrating, wavy light. They call that light. That's the form of energy that illuminates our world. But I'm saying there's a second form of energy which has been overlooked by modern science. Which is spin, which is the vortex. And it's this spin of energy, this spinning light, that sets up the forms of our world. And the basic form is depicted by this ball of wool, the basic form of the vortex of energy. When the light spins, it sets up a ball because this is the way that lines move, that lines, when you wind a line in a spiral, it forms a sphere. That's just the way it goes. It's free to spin on all these different axes. You end up with this spherical vortex. And these spherical vortices are the subatomic particles of matter. So there are two forms of energy, two ways in which light moves. The wave form of energy, giving us visible light, heat, gamma rays, microwaves. And the vortex form, which sets up matter, atoms, and the world in which we live, all the shapes. And the properties of matter are explained by the vortex. For example, I'm leaning against this pillar of stone. And if I go like that, why doesn't it move? It doesn't move, it doesn't shift because of the inertia of these subatomic vortices. All locked together by chemical bonds to form the stone. And how are those chemical bonds formed? Well, the vortex doesn't stop. It doesn't have a sur surface. It just extends into infinity. And every vortex is overlapping every other vortex. And these overlapping vortices set up the fields of force, the electric charge that locks these subatomic vortices into atoms, into crystals, into molecules, to rock and grass and tree and you and me. This is how it works. It's so simple. The vortices are overlapping, they extend into infinity, and as they overlap, they interact. They're either attracted together or they push apart. And all, all of this is explained in the quantum vortex, in the book. And why is this stone pillar so inert? What sets up the inertia? Well, it's the spin of the energy. If you spin a pebble on a pond, it skips over the surface of the pond because the spin in that plane stops it going this way or that way. So it sets up an inertia to movement out of the plane of spin. Well, here you've got the spin on all these different planes, on all these different axes. So there's resistance to movement in any direction. So this is the inertia of mass explained. So we can explain away the properties of materiality. Materialism is a delusion, it's an illusion created by spin.
So these particles are not particles of something. There's nothing moving. They're not, they're not entities that exist and move. They're movement that sets up the entities. It doesn't matter whether you think it's an atom that's moving. The atom exists and moves in a void of space. This is the basic bedrock of science. That it's called materialism. It's the atomic hypothesis, the material hypothesis of a Greek philosopher called, called Democritus. And it's the wrong idea. The religions have this idea that a God exists, pre-exists movement, that God creates, God acts. Again, that's the same hypothesis, that something exists and then acts. Whereas what physics is showing is the action exists first and sets up the things that act. There's a primary existence of the quantum. The quantum is the smallest particle of energy. That's what quantum means, a quantity of energy. And all we know about these particles of energy is their shape. They're either a waveform, and I'm saying, or a vortex form. And their speed. They're little bits of speed waving or spinning. It's hard to grasp. There's nothing actually there. Because they're more like thoughts than things. The world we're living in is, is like it's a dream state. The Aboriginals got it right. They, you know, the idea we live in dream states. We're living in a dream. Hard to grasp. But the universe is more like a great thought than a great, great machine. And when I was four, I, I said I was going to prove the existence of God through science, and the proof is very simple. How can there be a great thought without a great thinker? So underlying, what is it that underlies thought? Well, the thing that underlies thought is consciousness, conscious awareness. So what is in me that is conscious or consciously aware looking out my eyes at you and you're looking at the picture of me on the screen? That is the conscious awareness that underlies everything every particle of energy, every wave form and vortex form is an act of imagination. So it's not that there's a being called God that is imagining everything. There's just the state of conscious awareness that is imagining the state of activity. And they coexist. It's not that the universe is the mind of God. The universe is a mind that we call God. Because if this idea is correct, then if particles of energy are more like thoughts than things, then a thought is a particle of intelligence. Therefore, intelligence exists in the quantum fabric of the universe. You can't exclude intelligence from evolution if nothing exists but intelligence. And this intelligence, under, intelligent underpin to everything that is conscious, that is aware, that is assimilating information and imparting information. That is life.
everything is alive. Life is the essence of everything. Underlies everything, underlies the electron. Every atom is alive. It's all, this is all semantics, but you know, there's this ubiquitous principle that brings everything into being. I mean, I'm sitting here listening to the birds and looking at the grass and the flowers and the trees. How do they happen? Where do they come from? Yeah, the theory of evolution is great, but not when you exclude intelligence. There's intelligence underlying everything. It's built into the fabric of the universe. So it's like we need to get this new way of understanding reality. And it comes from the, the vortex theory, because as soon as we realize that there is no materiality, there's no material substance, that this is the illusion of material, then we realize there's purpose underlying everything, there's conscious awareness of underlying everything, there's sensitivity. Every creature, every plant is sensitive, is conscious. And we have to treat everything with respect. And then there are the issues of the other worlds. There's, you know, what are, what are these angels people talk about? What are these spirits that people talk about? What is spirituality? Well, it's, again, very, very easy to explain from the vortex. The world that we live in is formed of light spinning to form these vortices, subatomic particles, or undulating to form the quanta, the visible light that provides us with heat and illumination. And the underlying speed of movement in these forms is the speed of common light. Now the thing is you can't move this vortex faster than the energy that forms it. Because when you accelerate the vortex, you're pushing it with a wave. That's why vortices move in wavy lines. They call it wave particle duality because the, the waveform of energy drives into the vortex form. And this is, a, 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 the vortex is a trap. It drives in and it gets caught in the spiral space path of the vortex. Because the vortex is space. The, central part of the vortex is the mass we perceive and the vortex energy extending into infinity is space and, and the force fields are all just the extending vortices all interacting with each other overlapping and interacting winding together or pushing apart But the underlying speed of the energy that forms the world we live in is the speed of light as we measure it. But there could be other worlds in which the speed is faster than the speed of light. Because you see, although I can't move the vortex particle faster than the energy that's pushing it along like so. So the tip of the quantum gets caught in the vortex and pushes it forward like a tadpole. Okay? And that's what physicists have found. You can't accelerate a particle faster than the speed of light. But there's no reason why the speed of the energy within the vortex and within the wave cannot exist with speeds faster than the speed of light common light. But if that were so, they would set up their own domain, their own continuum of space and time. And the, the physics of that world could be identical to the physics of our world. Vortices and waves and charges, electric charge, magnetism, all the laws of physics could be the same. 
but they would be relative to a higher speed of energy. The Einstein constant of relativity would be different. And all speeds between zero and the speed of light belong to our world. But all speeds between zero and the speed of twice the speed of light would belong to the world which I, of super energy. We live in a world of energy and this would be the world of super energy. And because all speeds between zero and twice the speed of light are part of that world of super energy, our world of energy would be a lesser part. It would be a part of the greater world of super energy. But the greater world of super energy would not be contained with the, in the world of energy. It would be beyond the world of energy. And I use the matchbox analogy for this. Imagine our world is this box of matches and inside it's populated by matchbox people. But all they can see, they're, conf they're confined, they're contained by this box. All they can see is up to the walls of the box. They're not aware of this world outside. So where I'm sitting is like the world of super energy and this, the world of energy is represented by this box of matches. And these silly little matchbox people they imagine, they say, well, we can't see anything beyond the walls of the matchbox, so nothing exists outside of the matchbox. It's called matchbox mentality, which is what scientists and skeptics and materialists and physicalists and whatever they call themselves are suffering from, matchbox mentality. They're not allowing for greater possibilities. But once we explain away materialism, physicalism, as an illusion set up by spin, which the yogis called Maya. Because don't forget, I got this idea of the vortex of energy from yogic philosophy, from ancient yogic philosophy. So the same people who came up with the idea of the vortex being the basis of matter, came up with the idea of Maya being the illusion of forms set up by this spin. So materialism is an illusion. People are deluded by materialism. It's not the God delusion we should be concerned about. It's the material delusion. Because once we realize that there's no thing spinning, we realize that the basis of everything, the basis of reality is consciousness. It doesn't matter what you call it. You can call that consciousness, that universal consciousness, God. But intelligence is implicit in it. That conscious awareness because it's more a thought than a thing, it's a, it's a particle of consciousness, it's a particle of awareness, it's a particle of intelligence. If you call that universal creative imagination God, Nothing, nothing can exist without it because there's no thing. There's just these thoughts, these abstractions. And if you call it life, that makes sense of everything. And that same conscious awareness is imagining these worlds beyond the speed of light. It imagines faster speeds and faster speeds, all spinning, creating worlds, all undulating, creating light before the light we, we perceive, beyond the light we perceive. The yogis used to teach that the light we see is just a denser form of mind. Mind underlies everything. So these worlds beyond the speed of light, I call the worlds of super energy. And our world is contained as part of the super energy. 
And just as the matchbox people can't see me out here, we can't see the beings that populate the worlds of super energy because they're not contained in our space and time. The physical light doesn't reflect off them, it goes straight through them. Because they are the, the, the super energy exists beyond the domain of energy. But energy is part of the realm of super energy, so the super energy light reflects off physical objects. So if they're beings in these other worlds, they can see us, even though we can't see them. And this is what the ancients believed, that there are angels all around us. We can't see them because they're moving too fast. They recognize that the separation between us and these spirits, these angels, is a factor of speed. Makes you think, doesn't it? This whole idea of seeing is believing. That's just part of the illusion of Maya. That's just part of matchbox mentality. We can only see nothing exists but the walls of the matchbox. Remember that. Do you want to be one of these? Do you want to be a little matchbox man with your matchbox mentality and your limited view of the world? Because you can't see beyond the matchbox. It's time we woke up and allow for the existence of greater levels of reality of higher dimensions. Because it is very important to us, because near-death experiences are saying we go somewhere else. We've got to explain all this stuff. We can't just go on explaining things away. You know, amazing crop formations keep appearing in the crop field, in the, in the corn fields or the rape fields. No muddy footprints appear. They're, they're just complex. No, they just couldn't be produced by a gang of idiots with their planks, their boards and their bits of string. And how do we explain what's happening to people when they go somewhere else, when they, when they die and come back with a story to tell? Do we just dismiss it or do we allow for the possibility that we don't actually come from here? We don't, this isn't our true home. We're visitors here. We come from a greater level of reality. We come into this physical domain for a learning experience. And we, our consciousness is in the super energy body. The idea I'm presenting is that you're growing a super energy body in parallel to your physical body. So you've got two bodies. And this explains the two body dilemma people experience in near death experiences where they are in a body looking down at their body. They get very confused. What's that lying on the bed? What's that tangle in the wreckage of the accident? What's that lying on the operating table as they're above their body floating, looking down? They're in a body, they can see, they can hear. They're aware of what's going on. There's this lovely story of a near-death experience, where out-of-body experience, where somebody died during an operation. They found themselves floating above their body, watching. They were looking at the doctors and nurses. And I think it was the anaesthetist or somebody was trying to get a ventilator down, down in, 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 into the, the patient. They were in a crisis because the patient had passed on, passed away. And they couldn't because the dentures were in the way. So he was up there and he saw this nurse and he noticed there was, she had red hair coming, poking out from under, under her cap. And she took his dentures and she opened a drawer on a trolley and just stuffed it in the second drawer down. 
okay? There's dentures. And he was dead. <laughs> He's, he was on the slab. Anyway, they managed to bring him back. And after the operation, you know, he was, he was in the, in the intensive care unit or something. And this nurse walked by with red hair and he said, oh, you're the nurse. You took out my dentures and put them in the drawer. <laughs> you can imagine her reaction. He'd never seen her before. It's the first time he'd seen her in the normal conscious state. But during his operation, he'd seen her put his dentures in the drawer. Now, how do you explain that? <laughs> With this snuff it hypothesis that when we die, we snuff out like a candle. There's nothing else. There's nothing else. How do you explain people floating above their bodies in an accident, in a body? in an operating situation, and then come back, back into the body, they snap back in. Well, it's simple. We've got a, well, I call it the hyperphysical, the next level out, twice the speed of light is the hyperphysical realm. And you, we're all growing a hyperphysical body of atoms and molecules and cells identical to this physical body. And what happens is that the hyperphysical body overlays the physical body and interpenetrates it. And this is possible because space and time are set up on each plane of reality. So you've got the space and time set up by physical energy and you've got the space and time set up by superphysical energy. But they're, they're different space times. And because they're different, they can coincide, they can overlap. The separation between the worlds is not space and time. Space and time doesn't exist between them. It, is, it exists on each plane, each level. So they're separated by the speed of the energy. So they, they can overlay and overlap. This is why the angels can move right through you. It's why people in their hyperphysical body can walk through a physical wall. There's another amazing story. These stories, they're all recorded at the University of Virginia. They've got in the medical school, they've got a whole department focusing on near-death experiences. And they've got thousands and thousands of stories like this story, case studies. And they're all rigorously examined to comply with the, the scientific method to make sure that they, there's no easy explanation. But there was someone who died during an operation and floating above his body. And then he said he walked through the hospital walls outside. And what's interesting with this somebody, he was blind and he was blind from birth. So he'd never seen anything, but now he could see. And he walked through the walls of this hospital outside and he saw snow for the first time. And then he saw railway tracks he knew these things existed because he'd been told about them, but he'd never seen them before. And then as he was staring at the tracks that showing through the snow, suddenly a train went roaring by. He'd never seen a train before, but he noticed as the train went down the track, it had a big arrow pointing that way on the back. The last, the back carriage had a big arrow on it. Oh, he thought, you know, he just noticed it. Anyway, he came back this blind man, he came back into his blind body and couldn't see anything anymore. And after his operation, he recovered. He came back into his body. They brought him back, resuscitated him. He told them what he'd seen as a blind man. <laughs> and he told them about this train with the arrow on it. So you know what they did at Virginia University, the scientists who are not into matchbox mentality, who are a little bit open-minded and investigate things instead of explaining them away, wasting time and money explaining things away. What they did is they checked out with the railway company the trains that were passing the hospital during the time of the operation. They knew when the guy was on the operating table 
and it turned out that a train had in fact passed the hospital during the time of the operation and sure enough the back wagon of this train had an arrow on it. That's all recorded at the University of Virginia. Blind men see. How is that possible? It's possible because the super energy body has eyes to see and can see into this physical world because of these laws. There are two basic laws. The first law is the law of coincidence, which is where the worlds coincide and overlap. And the second law is the law of subsets, where the lesser world is part of or a subset of the greater world. Put these two, two laws together and you understand everything in supernatural and spiritual. It's all just easy peasy. Makes sense. So what happens is that he, we are not these physical bodies. These physical bodies are just vehicles that we occupy for the duration of our time on this physical plane for the physical learning we have to experience down here. We belong in these hyperphysical or super energy bodies. These, super bodies and they come into coincidence they overlay and because of this law of subsets energy flowing downhill they can see into us our world in in our hyperphysical body we can see into this world And when we come back into the physical body, having had that outer body experience with eyes that work, if you're blind, we come snap back. They experience this when people come back. It's like a shock. They snap back. You may find this, you know, when you're just sort of sleeping. You know, you fall asleep, you're just, just going into sleep. Then suddenly there's a noise and it jars you awake, it's like a shock. It's because you're drifting off into the dream world, into another dream state. And you're shocked back into consciousness in your physical body. So in our dreams, we're basically conscious of another, in another reality. We go off into another world, the world of dreams. And integrate our experiences in the physical world. And what happens is we snap back in, we come back into resonance with the physical body because the way it works is that we resonate with the DNA molecule. The DNA molecule is a coil, just like the coil in a radio set or television set. And we, we can actually transmit information from the hyperphysical body into the physical body. This is how intelligent evolution works. So there's a lot to cover, but, you know, I'm jumping ahead of myself a little bit, but as you can begin to see, the key points are these. Our world is formed of spinning light. And other worlds can be formed of spinning super light, where the speed of the light is faster than the speed of common light in our world. And the the super light spins in these super energy worlds and it undulates in waves and all the laws of physics are exactly the same. So in the super energy world there are trees and there are flowers and there are rabbits and there are people. And this is what the near-death experiences are establishing. When you separate from your physical body you go into a world just like this world. There's grass there, there's flowers there. They all speak about the grass and the flowers the trees and the mountains and they meet their pets because pets have these super energy bodies too that separate from them when they die and your pets are waiting to meet you in there when you go off in your super super physical super energy body you meet your pets in your super energy body it's an incredible we don't lose anything there's nothing to fear because we're not really here there is nothing to fear because we're not really here. We're just resonating with this world. It's, it's like a really advanced form of PlayStation. <laughs> Instead of just looking at the PlayStation, you get right inside the program. I mean, 
that's what this world is, you know. It's, it's like a computer program. We're inside. Our consciousness is inside the program. And we can come out of the program and go off and have a cup of coffee, have a bit of a break, you know. It's the way television's going to go in the, in the future. You know, people aren't going to just sit there looking at screens. They're going to get right into the screen, which is where we're at now in this world. <laughs> we just got to be careful we don't lose ourselves in the PlayStation, in the illusion. Because you see, what you're looking at at the moment is not really me. You may, say, you may sort of pick up your smartphone and say, where is he? Where's David Ash? How can you fit into this little box of mine, this little funny little flat thing I've got in my hands called an iPhone or something? But you're not actually, I'm not in there. See, you can see me, but I'm not actually in there. What you're seeing is a bunch of impulses, <laughs> which give a picture of me, set up the illusion of me, the mayor of me, if you see. <laughs> and it's like that in this world. <laughs> Just the way it is. This world is just a bunch of impulses. We're inside a program. They call it the matrix, don't they? <laughs> it all fits together, you know, it all fits together. Once we realize there is no material substance, there is nothing that moves. The whole universe is a bunch of impulses called quanta, quantum theory. And the key to it all is the spin, the spin explains the material illusion. And step aside, Richard Dawkins, you got it wrong. God is not the illusion. We're not deluded by God. Materialism is the illusion. We're deluded by materialism. Thank you for listening. <laughs>